This is Love for the Lost Live. We're here every Monday from 7 to 8. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We're so glad you're listening in tonight. Very special guest tonight. I'm really excited about our guest tonight, and we're going to just get into his testimony and his ministry in just a few moments. But I just want to give you a little information about Love for the Lost. We're here every Monday from 7 to 8 live. All of our episodes are archived. You are more than welcome and blessed. We bless you to download them and pass them along to your friends, to your family. Use them for teaching purposes or whatever will encourage somebody in a spiritual way. And we just want to serve the body of Christ with any tool, any spiritual weapon or insight biblical wisdom and how to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, how to become a better disciple of Jesus, our Savior. Well, if you have questions, comments, concerns, prayer requests, we welcome you to phone 1-855-917-3524. That's 1-855-91-SELA. And you can also Skype at SELA Radio, S-E-L-A-H, Radio Number 1. And you can also email me, Mike, at soulwinners, with a Z, dot O-R-G. If you have a prayer request or a comment or a question, we would love to hear from you. Send me a question, I'll send you a Bible. How's that? That's a good deal. You can email me, Mike, at soulwinners, dot O-R-G. And there's also a live chat tonight on Facebook and Spreaker. And if you're one of those techie people that have a mobile device, you, there's a download for a tuning app. You can enter CLA Radio 24/7 in the search, and you can download a tuning app for your iPhone, your iPad, your iPod, or an Android device, and you can listen that way as well. I know some people do that, and, and they listen on their mobile devices. Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And I've got to apologize for two weeks ago. I was just coughing and carrying on. We had to pull the plug. Praise the Lord. In all things, give thanks. And, of course, none of us like getting sick and ill. But even in those situations, we can trust God and count on His blessings to help us in those situations. As I said before, you can download any one of our episodes. They're all archived. And tonight is going to be a very special episode. I think you're going to want to download it. I think you're going to want to listen to it more than once. We have a great guest here. His name is Don Sunshine. Yes, that's his real name. And he'll explain a little bit about that as we go through the hour. And Don is an evangelist. And he has what is known as Don Sunshine Evangelist Ministries. Am I correct there? Just Don Sunshine Ministries. Don Sunshine Ministries. <clears throat> and so I met Don uh, last week, and I invited him to come on over. He was so happy to be here. He likes to talk and, and get his ministry uh, some exposure. And if you're a church pastor, you're a church leader, and you want somebody to come and do a training ministry for you, he will certainly try to accommodate you in that area. Now, he's not going to travel internationally, I don't think. At least not at this point. Not at this point. But he will travel quite a distance to help you. And he does it really as uh, travel expenses plus a love offering. So he is blessed to be able to do that. And he would like to bless you in that as well. So I'm going to just get the hour started by talking to Don and asking him a few, a few questions and letting him expound on his answers as long or as short as he wants. So welcome, Don. Glad you're here tonight. Good to be here tonight. And tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm always interested in how you came to faith, how you came to know Jesus in a personal way and what it was that entered into your life, a person, uh, a circumstance that caused you to come to faith. Well, I was one of six children raised in northern New Jersey, mm. and we were raised Catholic. And one of my older brothers, who happens to be a chiropractor, uh, the Lord found him. Mm. He called my mom and my youngest brother to come over, and he shared the gospel with them. My youngest brother got saved. 
<clears throat> he tried to share the gospel with me and he scared me and I kind of pushed him away and said, no, no, no I don't want to hear this stuff. And uh, I ended up going to college. And after my freshman year in college, uh, I decided I wanted to get married. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, now I got the cough thing. Uh, <laughs> And being a Catholic, you know, I said to my girlfriend, I said, well, we need to go and meet with the priest. She says, well, I'm not Catholic. I'm not getting married in a Catholic church. Uh -huh. And I said, well, that's the only place I can get married. And she said, well, no, it's tradition you get married in the wife's church. I said, but you don't go to church. And she <laughs> says, but my mom does. And I said, where does your mom go? And she says, well, he said, she said, he goes, she, we go, or I'm sorry, she goes to the North Caldwell Christian and Missionary Alliance Church. And I said, what See in the world is that? Mm -hmm. And she said, I don't know. Let's go and talk to the pastor and find out. So we made an appointment. We went in and sat down and told him we were engaged and wanted to be married. And he said, well, I can marry you biblically if something is true. And I said, well, what's that? He said, well, you both have to be saved or both unsaved. I can't marry you if you're mixed. And I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and he said, well, do you have any religious training? I said, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Catholic. And he said, well, what got up? He went over to this library, pulled a Bible off the wall, and he says, this is a Catholic Bible. I said, yeah, it looks like a Catholic Bible. You know, I don't really read it, so I can't tell you for sure. But mm -hmm. he said, trust me, it is. And he started flipping through and he showed me the plan of salvation. And I was like stunned. And he said, would you like to make a decision right now to surrender your life to the Lordship of Christ? Repent, that means turn from your sins and trust Christ to save you. And know that you're going to go to heaven if you die. Wow. And I said, well, I'd really like to, but I can't. And he said, what do you mean you can't? I said, this sounds too good to be true. <laughs> you know, I said, I, I got this drilled into me for, you know, 19 years that you don't know where you're going. And there's right. no, you know, you're good as to way you're bad. And mm -hmm. He, I said, I need to think about this. And he said, well, don't think too long because, you know, you, you don't know how much time you have. Now, I'm 19 years old at the time. Right. So my wife and I both left and she went home and I went home and we both individually that night just kind of knelt down by our beds and gave our lives to Christ. Amen. And we were baptized after that. We were married in the church and uh, began serving Christ. Wow. Christian Missionary Alliance. Yep. Pastor Alliance. Yep. led you both to Christ in premarital counseling. Yes. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. It is amazing. God is amazing. So tell me then, you now you're married. Uh, how, what was life like after that? What was life, you know, how did things go? Struggles, difficulties? Well, uh, you know, you have the normal struggles that any marriage has, you know, right. two very different people trying to get along with each other and live with each other. And uh, we, attend, we I was going to school in Rhode Island at the time, and we went to an Alliance church in Providence. Mm -hmm. And there were only a handful of very old people there. And every week we came by, another person had gone home to be with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And finally, we had a knock at our door one day, and it was the pastor. He said, there's no one left in the church. Wow. We're closing the doors. So we ended up driving up to Seekonk, Massachusetts, just over the border, to go to an Alliance church there. And uh, we ended up moving back to New Jersey, uh, continued my education, and I became a police officer in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And uh, continued to attend Alliance churches and was involved, you know, as heavily as I could be with the schedule that I had. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they particularly liked it when I came to church after working the midnight shift in full uniform with a gun on my hip. <laughs> they wanted me to take the offering and just shake the plate a little bit if, you know, <laughs> people didn't give enough. But, uh, yeah, I, I was a police officer uh, on a SWAT team in New Jersey. Wow. I, and I did that for about four years. and. Uh, God orchestrated me getting out of that because I ended up having to sacrifice what I believed to get ahead, and I refused to do that, mm -hmm. and I ended up going into computers. And uh, okay. the entire time, starting in 1974, I was working with teenage boys in Christian Service Brigade okay. because I was an Eagle Scout, loved scouting, and I was thinking about getting involved as an assistant scoutmaster somewhere. And a Christian man said, well, why don't you consider Christian Service Brigade? I said, I don't even know what that is. Mm. And he said, well, it's kind of Christian Boy Scouts. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I looked into it, and at the time I was driving a school bus, and I had a whole busload of kids that I could invite to come out to brigade. And so I was a brigade captain in a number of churches for 30 years. Wow. I saw a lot of kids come to faith in Christ. A number of them are in full-time ministry. They've been, they're pastors. One was a chaplain. They're certified Christian counselors. And, uh, you know, a lot of them are still following the Lord today. Amen. And uh, as a result of that, you know, I ended up, well, I'll, I'll, I'll end it there and see what your next question is. How about well, that? My question is, after you came to faith in Christ, did you have a burden for souls? Did you have a burden for evangelism? It yeah. It seems like you did from the things you're saying. I had one from day one. From okay. the, When I realized that, and I was a pretty good kid because I, you know, I never drank, never smoked, never took drugs. I was a, an Eagle Scout Catholic who wanted to be a cop. How yeah. bad of a kid do you think I was, right? <laughs> so, you know, I was a pretty decent kid by the world standards. 
But when I got that burden lifted that my, I wasn't going to have to pay for the stupid stupid things I've done, the sinful things I've done, Amen. I was out of control. I mean, I had no tact. I was trying to drag everybody to, to go to heaven with me, mm-hmm. sharing my faith with everybody that would listen. And they all thought I was crazy and I had lost it and um, offended a lot of people, pushed mm-hmm. off a lot of people because I had zero tact. This is life and death, I figured, you know. <laughs> I got to get them I got to get them in the lifeboat with me. Yeah. And uh and then I kind of retreated from that and became, you know, I was working with the kids in Christian Service Brigade, sharing the gospel with them, but I really wasn't sharing my faith with the people that God connected me with every day. Mm-hmm. I became kind of what I'll call the secret agent Christian. Mm-hmm. You know, if everything lined up and I felt the Holy Spirit's prompting and, and just everything was right, I'd maybe tell them about my faith. Mm-hmm. And then at, as time went by, I had this burden for souls all the time. That's why I worked with the kids in Christian Service Brigade. I love to see kids come to faith. And... It just became, it was it's part of who I was. Right. And it was, I think it was a gift that God gave me from day one. Mm. So before we go any further, there might be people listening tonight who are saying, what is he talking about coming to faith and the gospel and salvation? What does all that mean mm-hmm. to the listener out there tonight? Well, the reality of it is, you know, all of us are, are sinful. We've all done stuff to break God's laws. If we use the Ten Commandments as a standard and just say, hey, have you ever told a lie? Mm -hmm. Well, everybody who's honest is going to say, yeah, I've lied. So what are we called if we tell lies? We're a liar. Have we ever stolen anything? Well, everybody's probably taken something that didn't belong to them, so that makes us thieves. Mm -hmm. Uh, Have we ever looked at another person to lust after them? Well, if you've had hormones running through your body, every person has done that at one time or another. So Jesus said, if you've done that, you're an adulterer at heart. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Well, it's called blasphemy. We've all done that too, probably. Well, that's only four of the Ten Commandments, and we're batting a thousand. Right. If we look at the other six, we're going to be guilty of them as well. Mm-hmm. And so we've broken God's laws. We've alienated ourselves from him for all of eternity. And there's a, an eternal punishment that's promised to those that violate God's laws. But God loved us so much that 2,000 years ago, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, a perfect sacrifice, came to earth, lived among human beings, lived a perfect sinless life, and he was the perfect sacrifice for our sins. He paid our ransom that's due. Mm -hmm. And in order to accept that gift that God has given each and every one of us, because he says it is a free gift, all we have to do is be willing to surrender our lives to the Lordship of Christ in repentance. That means we're going to turn from our sins. Mm -hmm. And we're, with every ounce of our being, it means mind, heart, life, and purpose in the original language in, in the Greek, a word called metanoia. And we are going to trust Christ by faith to save us. Amen. And the Bible says when we do that, a supernatural thing happens. The Holy Spirit comes and indwells us. The slate is wiped clean. We are guaranteed our inheritance in heaven. And we begin a new life of following Jesus Christ. Amen. So I just thought that's important to talk about because if there's somebody listening tonight who is searching spiritually and people are always looking for truth, Amen. Uh, they may be saying, what, it, what am I here for? What's this all about? Right. What is life's purpose? Well, it's the most important decision that any human being can ever make because you're either going to go to a place that's beyond your wildest dreams wonderful or a place that's beyond your wildest nightmares horrible. Amen. And, you know, you have a choice. God's given us a choice, and we need to make that decision. Right. You're either a follower of Jesus Christ or you're a follower of Satan. Those are the only two options. Right. And you said it sounded too easy to be true right. when you first heard the message. And so what was it that you ha- did to receive into your life that gift that God God is offering you through Christ? Well, personally, what I did was I knelt down and I prayed. Okay. Okay, but the Bible says it's in Romans 10, it's a heart's decision. Mm -hmm. And you can make a decision without uttering one word in a prayer because God's examining the heart. You could also utter a prayer and lie to God and nothing will happen. Mm -hmm. And so God examines the heart. He's the only one that can do that. And in my particular case, he examined my heart and I expressed what was going on in my heart to God in the form of a prayer. Mm -hmm. And I said, Lord, I don't understand all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But what I heard today and what I saw in your word, I didn't call it your word at the time, I said in the Bible, um, I want that. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to know for sure that I'm going to heaven. There's no more important decision. Amen. And so somebody's listening tonight that may be facing that decision, we would encourage you to kneel down by your bed if the way Don did or say in your heart, receive Christ as your Savior and begin to live for him and trust him. And it's not that all your problems will go away. Am I right? Oh, that's, that's absolutely true. 
but that God will walk with you through Amen. those difficulties, and yeah. He will. He promises He will never leave you or forsake you. And so sometimes when somebody becomes a believer, the problems actually increase. Yeah. But they have that assurance they belong to him. Well, all of a sudden you have an enemy that you didn't have before because you were on his side. That's right. And his name is? Satan. Satan, right. That's right. So he doesn't bother the people he knows who are already his. Right. He goes after those who belong to the other team, Amen. belong to the other side. That's absolutely true. So uh, we've, we've gotten to the point where you're a police officer. Uh, you've moved off that uh, particular job. And then you did... I ended up selling uh, personal computers back okay. in 1980, selling Apple IIs with 48K of RAM, single floppy disk drive, and an RF modulator to your TV set for $1,840. Wow. Telling people that 48K of RAM was more memory than you could ever use. Right. And at the time, it was true, okay? Right. <laughs> but I ended up really excelling at sales, yeah. and I was in this little computer store in northern New Jersey. I ended up doing starting an outside, doing outside sales. And I was selling to tree surgeons, which was interesting. It was a little vertical market selling I was doing. And then because AT&T's corporate headquarters was right down the road, I ended up going into corporate sales. Mm. And that's really, really where I really excelled. Mm -hmm. And uh, did that for a number of years. And then I got called by a manufacturer, a software publishing corporation. I went to work for them as a regional manager. And then Apple called. I went to work for Apple as a business development executive in Pennsylvania and uh, Northern, well, Pennsylvania and, and Delaware. Mm -hmm. And that had me move from New Jersey to Pennsylvania. Okay. And when I got out here again, found a church that needed a, a battalion captain, and I picked up a Christian service brigade right where I left off. CMA church? Uh, actually, no. It was a Bible fellowship church. Bible fellowship. Couldn't okay. find a CMA church, so yeah. I did the Bible fellowship thing. Okay. So you go from the police officer to the corporate sales, and all during that time, your heart's beat is for the Lord as far as what? It's, just, it's sharing Christ with teenage guys and seeing them come to faith. And so you saw many, many opportunities and successes in those areas, spiritually yeah. speaking. Oh, yeah. yeah with I, young men coming to Christ. And as you said, many of them are in full-time ministry even today. Yes. And isn't that a blessing? Oh, it's beyond beyond a blessing. You know, Jesus says, you know, it's, it's don't worry about the you know earthly things. Mm -hmm. Worry about the spiritual things. Right. And when we focus on that, the blessings are eternal. Oh, amen. Amen to that. Amen. Yeah. So before we go further, I got to ask you a question. Yeah. Don Sunshine. <laughs> is that your real name? Yeah, I tell. Or is it an alias? <laughs> I tell people it was a great name when I was in sales, but it was a rotten name when I was a cop. <laughs> I mean, Officer Sunshine kind of sounds like a cartoon character or you know, <laughs> a, a superhero or something. But my grandfather was an Orthodox Jew in Germany in the early 1900s. His name was Harry Zunenschein. Wow. And Harry went to Oxford University in England, and he got a degree. And, he, and they said, Harry, what are your plans for the future? And he said, well, I'm going to emigrate to America. I have a sponsor. And they said, well, if you're going to go to America, you probably ought to have an English-sounding name. Does Zunenschein mean something in English? They said, well, yeah. He said, well, if you translate it directly, it means sunshine. They said, what a cool name. Call yourself <laughs> Harry Sunshine. So that's what he did, and that's where it came from. So you're, you're known as... Don Sunshine, and it comes from an Orthodox Jewish background. Yeah, from Germany. So would you consider yourself Messianic? Uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's hard. I, I was technically half Jewish and half Catholic, but I was raised Catholic. Wow, isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. So um, now you're in corporate sales. You're in Pennsylvania. Tell us the rest of the story. How did you how did you come to the point where it's Don Sunshine Ministry? Well, what happened was in 1998, my son graduated high school and my daughter got married within a month of each other. Okay. And it was getting kind of crowded in Berks County, Pennsylvania. And we had a, a hunting camp up in Tioga County in the northern tier. And we loved it up in the mountains. So we sold our home. We moved up in the mountains, found a beautiful log home. And we lived there and I continued to... Uh, work in the computer industry, doing consulting, uh, sales management, business development. And my wife worked at a local Christian chiropractor. <clears throat> we began listening to uh, the Family Life Network out of mm -hmm. Bath, New York, mm -hmm. Christian radio station. And I went on their website for something and saw they had an employment tab. So I clicked on the employment because I was really searching at this point saying, God, I owe you everything. Mm -hmm. And I'll do whatever it is you want me to do. I've been kind of living for myself, you know, all these years and, and I made a lot of money and, and did a lot of cool things. And uh, whatever it is you want me to do, I'll do it. Just show me what it is. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I saw they were looking for a youth action director. And I read the, the resume or what they were looking for, the, the criteria. And I thought, I have every one of these except one. One of them was music and drama. I thought, that's not me. Mm -hmm. So I called him up, talked to the, the, the head guy there. And, 
He said, tell me, uh, he, I said, how important is this music and drama thing? And he said, it's pretty important. It's the direction we think the youth program is going to go. I said, mm -hmm. oh, well, then I'm not the right guy. He said, wait a minute, tell me about yourself. So I shared with him all, all the crazy things I'd done with teenage guys to bring them out so that I could share Christ with them and ended up going through the whole process and was hired as the Youth Action Director at Family Life. Wow. So while I was there, we saw literally thousands of kids make professions of faith in Christ, first-time professions of faith with all the events we were doing, the, the ways to bring the kids out of the woodwork and get them into, you know, into a place where we could share Christ with them. And Ron Hutchcraft, who some of you probably know, mm -hmm. uh, came to speak at a pastor's conference about two second month after I was at Family Life. And because of my background, they asked me to be his escort slash bodyguard because he had requested a bodyguard. It's kind of a funny story. But in the course of driving around with Ron for three days, and by the way, when Ron was in northern New Jersey with Youth for Christ, I sold him his very first computers in ministry. Right? Yeah, years and years ago. Back in 1980, that was. And so I drove him around for three days. And in the course of a sharing, he said, you have amazing stories of you sharing your faith. He goes, why in the world aren't you teaching people to do what you do? Mm -hmm. And I said, Ron, I learned how to do what I do kind of the hard way. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, no one taught me this. I said, I kind of figured it out on my own because I had this burden and I knew I was supposed to be doing it. I knew I wasn't doing it. And, you know, I think the Lord convicted me that, hey, I'm supposed to be an ambassador. I'm supposed to be making disciples and I'm not doing it other than with the teenage guys. Right. You know, how do I do this? And I kind of figured it out on my own. And I said, Ron, I know how to do what I do. But I said, I can't take a group of people and have them follow me around in my life every day to show them how I do this. He said, well, you've got presentation skills. You've done, you know, keynote addresses for Apple and mm -hmm. corporate board presentations. He said, all you need is a starting point. Take my book, A Life That Matters, read that, and build a training. And he says, wherever it goes, it goes. So I built the training, and I taught it for the very first time 10 years ago this month to a youth group up on Lake Ontario. Mm -hmm. And because of the radio network, it changed so many lives up there that people were calling in. And all of a sudden, pastors were calling saying, hey, I don't want you to just come and teach my youth how to do this. I want my whole church to learn how to do what you're doing. Come on mm -hmm. over here. So I did 117 of these trainings when I was at Family Life, and it wasn't even part of my job description. Mm -hmm. And in October of 08, my wife and I left. We started Don Sunshine Ministries, and that's what we do full time. And that was a step of faith, tremendous faith. It was a huge step of faith. I mean, we had no equipment, no salary, no medical, no nothing, a mortgage payment, a car payment, and I was scared to death. Amen. But God's blessing. God took care of us. I mean, my, my uh, you know, wives can, can really stick the knife in you sometimes, if you know what I mean. They can really, uh, you know, I was, I was thinking, okay, I can go back into consulting, make some big bucks doing that, and do this on the side. And in my heart, I knew that's not what God wanted me to do. Mm -hmm. He didn't want me to go out and make a ton of money and, and focus my efforts on that. He wanted me to focus my efforts on equipping the church. Amen. And so my wife said to me, I was telling her about my struggle, and she said, do you really believe God wants you to do this? I said, yeah. And she goes, then why can't you just trust him? Wow. And I was like, oh, I hate when they do that. <laughs> so I said, all right, I'm scared to death. And I knelt down. I said, God, I am scared to death. And you know my heart, Lord. I don't know how we're going to pay our bills next month. I don't. I have three trainings on the calendar for the rest of the year. You know, the love offerings are pretty small. Uh, if I it took all the love offerings, offerings I got in the six, last six months, I don't think it would cover my mortgage. And miraculously, God has provided for us, and He's continued to do that for seven years now. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Yeah, amen. Praise the Lord. Well, that's obviously an indication He wants you in full time ministry. Yes. Yes. He's, he's proven he's, that over and over. So you were saying, you know, some of the stories that. Ron Hutchcraft said that you were sharing with mm -hmm. him about the ways in which you would share your mm -hmm. faith. Can, does one or two of those stories stand out in your thinking more than others? And, and would you share them with us? Well, I'll give you one that didn't happen prior to Ron Hutchcraft talking to me, but it's one of my favorites. Uh, my friend, Pastor Ron, he's uh, chairman of the board of my ministry, and I taught in his Christian school when I was at Family Life. Mm -hmm. And uh, he likes motorcycles the way I like motorcycles. Uh -huh. And so he said, Don, he said, I, I've never used that God-given interest in motorcycles for the kingdom. He says, if you have, are still willing to let me come with you, I'd like to go to Daytona Bike Week with you and see how you do this. And I said, yeah, come on along. So Ron has been coming with me every year since 2008. And I believe it was last year, we were down in Jupiter, Florida doing a training. And we uh -huh. headed north to go back to Daytona to share Christ with the bikers. And we stopped for dinner at this Cracker Barrel, and when we came out, the sun was setting, and I said, I thought, you know, it's getting kind of chilly. I said, I think I'm going to switch from my mesh jacket to my leather jacket. 
He said, I'll be good with what I have on. So we're driving north, and we're in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's pitch black. It's cold. And all of a sudden, he passes me. And I'm dragging a trailer with computers in it and projectors and literature. I mean, all kinds of stuff. And he's on a bike that's getting 50 miles a gallon. I'm getting 27. Mm -hmm. And I figure I've got another 35 miles before I need to gas up. So I'm thinking, okay, he just wants to lead for a little while. That's okay. Well, we come up to an exit, and he puts his turn signal on and goes off the exit. And I thought, what's he doing? You know, he can't need gas. Pulls into this gigantic gas station with like eight rows of pumps. It's lit up like daylight, and there's nobody there. And he pulls up to the pump and shuts his bike off. I pull up behind him, and I shut my bike off, and I looked at him. I said, really? And he says, oh, I don't need gas. He said, I'm freezing cold. I should have changed my jacket when you did. <laughs> he said, but as long as we're here, might as well gas up. So we start to gas up, and a man comes walking from <clears throat> the side of the building. And he says, excuse me, do you know where there's a real mechanic around here? Well, that's the connection. It's a, any simple little connection that you have with someone. They ask you a question. They make a statement to mm -hmm. you. That's an opportunity for you to share your faith with somebody. Mm -hmm. And so I said to him, no, sir, I, I really don't know. I said, I'm from Pennsylvania. He's from New York, and we're just passing through. And he said, oh, there's something wrong with my car. And I looked over. I said, with your Mercedes Benz? <laughs> and he said, yeah. And I said, well, what's it doing? And he told me. And I said, you know, I'm no mechanic. But I said, that sounds like a serpentine belt. And I said, if your serpentine belt is gone, you're not going anywhere tonight. Right. So he said, do you know how to tell? And I said, yeah, I can tell that. Okay. So I go walking over. And I said, what's your name? He said, my name's Mike. And his wife is standing outside the car. And I introduced myself to her. Her name was Gina. And I said, pop the hood, Mike. And I pulled a flashlight off my belt, and I looked in the engine. I said, yep, here's the problem. And I reached in and pulled out black spaghetti mm. that used to be a serpentine belt. <laughs> and I said, remember I mentioned the serpentine belt? This is what's left of yours. You're not going anywhere tonight. He goes, oh, this is a mess. He goes, I have a house about 180 miles south of here. He said, I'll have to have my driver come and get me. Wow. He goes, yeah, he says, I'll have to have the car towed. And I said, well, listen, Mike. I said, I can't do much more for you than I've already done, but... I could pray for you. Mm -hmm. He looked at me and he goes, what? I said, I'd love to pray for you and your wife. He goes, well, okay. <laughs> so I said, Ron, come here. I said, this is Mike and Gina. He said, hi, nice to meet you. And I said, see that on the ground? That's his serpentine belt. And he says, oh, you're not going anywhere tonight. <laughs> and Mike goes, yeah, I heard that already. I said, I want to pray for Mike and Gina. I want you to join me. So we put our arms around these two people we just met. And I, um, I prayed something like this. I said, Father, I want to thank you for leading us to this gas station tonight to meet Mike and Gina. Mm. I'm sorry that their car broke down, but I believe that you allowed this to happen because you wanted us to meet these people because you want these two people in heaven with you when they die. Amen. I pray that they'll get their car fixed, that they'll get their ride to where they need to go, and I pray that uh, they'll take what we share with them and that you'll use that to draw them to yourself and that they will be born again and we'll see them at he in heaven someday. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> She crosses herself, and he looks at me, and he goes, what kind of church do you go to? <laughs> and I said, I go to a Bible-believing church. He said, I'm a Catholic. I said, so was I. Let me tell you my story. Mm. And I shared how God had saved me mm -hmm. at that premarital counseling time. Gave them a Gospel of John with the plan of salvation in it to read. It's right in the front, the plan mm -hmm. of salvation. They agreed to read it. And Ron and I gave them each a hug, and we walked away, and we turned and looked at each other and just started laughing. And I said, can you believe what had to happen tonight for us to meet those two people? Right. All those little things. Mm -hmm. if that's a sovereign God doing what a sovereign God can do. Amen. And, I, and so we got on the bikes. We you know, got, got our coats on and helmets. And as we turned to leave, they were sitting on the bench in front of the convenience store reading the Gospel of John together. Wow. Isn't that something? Now, my only regret is I didn't get any of their info. Because right. I would have loved to have followed up with them. And I thought about it after we were left and we were going up the road. I was just stunned at what God had done. Amen. And this happens all the time, though. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some times when I go out into the world, I'll share with one person. There are other days it's three people or five or seven people. Mm -hmm. And we were down in Daytona this year, and we bought these uh, these headsets that you can talk Bluetooth back and forth to each other. Because we were going to be on motorcycles for 23 days, mm -hmm. doing five trainings across Florida and riding all over, we did 3,000 miles. We didn't spend a nickel on a hotel. We, we, we went in with church families and we met some wonderful mm -hmm. brothers and sisters in the Lord. Uh, but couldn't figure out how to make these things work. So they had a booth, they weren't selling them, but the manufacturer was in a booth outside the Daytona International Speedway. Mm -hmm. And so we went up and these two guys named Mike helped us out. They, were, they went over and above the call of duty. In fact, I wrote letters of recommendation to the company about them because they were so good to us. Mm -hmm. We shared Christ with them 
And then while I was sitting on my motorcycle, I have an Indian motorcycle, which is a huge conversation starter. Mm -hmm. And eight different people came up to me while I sat on that bike and asked questions about the bike. Amen. Every wow. one of those was a divine appointment. I laid hands on people and prayed for them. I shared Christ with all these people, gave them gospel literature to take home so they mm -hmm. could have something to read afterwards. I had one guy come up to me. His name was Steve. And he goes, are those lights standard, those LEDs? I said, yeah, they are, front and back. And we talked, and I said, so are you from around here? And he goes, yeah. I said, I actually retired down here. I said, well, where'd you retire from? And I don't remember where he told me he was from. I said, what'd you do for a living? He said, I worked in the gambling industry my whole life. Mm -hmm. And I said, really? He said, yeah. And I said, let me ask you a question, Steve. Are you gambling your eternity? <laughs> where you're going to spend eternity? He goes, well, that sounds like a dumb thing to do. I said, well, are you? He goes, well, I don't really know. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, if you were to die suddenly today, where do you think you'd spend eternity? He goes, well, I, I, I'd hope I'd go to heaven. And I said, well, why do you think that? And he says, well, because I, I, I think I'm a really good person. Mm. And I said, are you really? Mm. And he said, yeah. And then I took him through the those questions about from the from the Ten, Ten Commandments. Commandments. Yeah. Right. And I ended up laying hands on this guy. I mean, there's people walking by. They're, they're standing around us watching this, you know. I'm praying for this guy. Gave him something to read to, you know, take with him. And mm -hmm. I'll know what happens when I get to heaven. Amen. You see, yeah. our job is only to plant and water seeds. Right. You know, it's it, and God's the only one that can cause the growth. Right. So as long as I'm faithful with those opportunities, He's smiling. I was reading in Corinthians the other day. It says, you know, I planted, uh, Apollos watered, watered but God, God gave the increase. Amen. Amen. And so I think if we're faithful stewards, yeah, we can trust the results into Amen. God's care. Yeah. And uh, it, doesn't it take the pressure off us in a way? Well, you know, one of the things we talk about in our training is fear. Fear is a, a big part of this because that's mm -hmm. what keeps everybody from sharing their faith. Yes. And so what I have the audience do is I said, let's list every single fear that you can come up with. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to show you how to beat the fear. And what the, one of the, almost always the first fear that's mentioned is rejection. Mm -hmm. And when you understand that I can't cause the growth no matter what I do, mm -hmm. uh, Paul planted Apollos word of only God can cause the growth. All God expects us to do is say, hey, listen, pal, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're lost. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're, and you're you're going to a really bad place unless you change. Let me tell you how that can change. Right. And what happens is you leave the results to God, and so the rejection button never works anymore. The mm -hmm. demons can push that rejection button all day long, and you're not worried about it because. And I've had people say to me, Don, the most liberating thing I've heard that I heard you say today was, "It's okay if somebody says no. I haven't failed." That's right. Because they say no. Right. The only way you fail is if you haven't told them their condition and told them how to fix it. That's right. And that's all God expects us to do, leave the results to him. Well, it's uh, I'm thinking of the prophet uh, Jeremiah uh, or Ezekiel, where he says you're the watchman on the wall. Yeah. And we're called to sound the warning. Mm -hmm. And God expects us to be faithful in that. Yeah. And if we're not, he'll hold us accountable yeah. in and that's so many a, ways. That's a scary thought. Right. You know, and here's, here's, here's something that, that increases the fear factor, is that I believe that every single person you meet has been handpicked by God. Mm-hmm. And that he brings, perspective. he brings us people yeah. every day that we connect with. Some of mm -hmm. them are neighbors, they're coworkers, they're friends, they're relatives, or people we meet at the gas mm -hmm. station. We sit next to them on an airplane. Mm -hmm. Some people are going to be on our stretch of beach, if you will, mm -hmm. one time. We're going to have one chance to rescue them. Right. And you're never going to see them again until mm -hmm. the judgment seat of Christ. Mm -hmm. And then there's others that are going to come and go every day. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, God's going to hold us accountable for each of them. That's right. And, you know, sadly, nine out of ten people statistically don't share their faith with anybody. Mm -hmm. And it's really not hard to do. Right. You know, I've taught this same training 451 times in 22 states in Canada. And we've equipped over 24,000 people to start doing this every day as a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I teach the exact same training at Christian middle school retreats. Mm -hmm. And those kids put it into practice. Wow. In fact, I have the testimonies of the parents of two seven-year-olds who sat through this on a Sunday morning and early afternoon and went home and started sharing Christ with their adult neighbors. They were leading friends to Christ on the school bus. Wow. I mean, amazing stuff. Right. You know, Because it's not hard to do. It's not hard to do. We it's think it's just hard. just telling people right. how to be saved. Well, and the problem is that the devil has lied to all of us and told us we can't do this. Mm -hmm. He's saying, you don't have you haven't you haven't memorized enough scripture yet. Mm -hmm. You're not a minister. You haven't right. been to Bible college. Right. What if they ask you a question? You're not going to know the answer to it. Mm -hmm. What if they reject you? What if they laugh at you? What if they make fun of you? What if they won't be your friend anymore? Mm -hmm. And they they work these fear buttons all day long on us, and we just believe them that they're true, 
right. and really they're not true mm-hmm. because God has promised to give us the strength to do what he has commanded mm-hmm. but the strength may not be evident however until we step out in faith and actually begin doing the task right have you found in your experience that lots of people are really spiritually hungry that they're searching that they really want to know truth and they maybe they're stiff arming God in a way but Lots of people really are searching for truth. Yeah, one of the things we've noticed, like at Bike Week, that's a pretty rough crowd down there. It can mm-hmm. be. Every year. No, just before you go, Bike Week, Daytona Beach, Daytona Florida. Daytona Beach, Florida, in March. It's, it's one week long in March, and bikers from all over the country go there. When we, yeah, when we first started attending, it's over, I don't know what it is, it's over 70 years old now. Okay. But... Over half a million people used to converge on the Daytona area the first week of March for this bike week. And there's vendors all over, and there's all kinds of stuff going on. And so being I have a love for riding motorcycles, God gave me that love for a reason. Mm -hmm. He wants me to use that love of of that particular activity Mm -hmm. to further the kingdom. Amen. And if guys who ride motorcycles don't share with people who ride motorcycles, who's going to? Mm -hmm. And that's a point of connection. Because when I pull up to a gas pump and on a motorcycle and someone pulls up in a car, just, there may not be a conversation. But if two guys pull up on motorcycles, there will be a conversation almost yes. always. Yes. And so you use those connections to as an opportunity to share. And what we've noticed over the past several years is people are more open than ever. Because if they're paying attention to what's going on in the world, That's right. they're getting concerned. Right. And we have the answers that they don't have. We have peace inside that mm-hmm. they don't have. Mm-hmm. And so we have something that is desirable. Mm-hmm. And they recognize right away there's something different about you. And I don't really know what it is, but right. I'd like to know. So there's a real openness to the gospel. Yeah. And I've seen that, too, in the last couple of years, an openness to the gospel that I haven't seen in the last several mm-hmm. years. And so tell me more about what you do with your training sessions. I know you, I mentioned, or I heard you mention last week, uh, it's a four hour session, it's a five hour session. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about it. We, it's a four, it's four hours of instruction plus okay. breaks. So a typical Saturday would be 9 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. Okay. We take a short break at 10.30, we break again at noon time for lunch and we finish after lunch. On a Sunday, we'll get more of the church people to attend because everyone is scared to death to do this. Yes. And I jokingly say, you know, when someone looks at the church calendar and it, there's an evangelism training on Saturday and they see there's nothing on their calendar, they will call the dentist and beg for a root canal on Saturday <laughs> so they don't have to come to the training because it's less painful to be in the dental chair than sitting through this. And so on average, having done over 400 of these, 10 to 15 percent of the Sunday morning attendance will come. Mm. That's it. Mm-hmm. And there are reasons for that. But there are exceptions, too. We've had... 80%, 90%. We had one that was like 99%. Mm-hmm. But the pastor made all of his people, it was a small church out near Pittsburgh, made all of his people sign a document saying they'd be there. <laughs> and he had 26 out of 27. Well, the one lady had her tooth pulled the day before and she wasn't feeling so well. So she didn't Deliberately. Go. Deliberately, yeah, exactly. <laughs> before she knew it was happening. But anyway, um, on Sundays, we work around the church schedule. So a typical Sunday for a church might be, we'll, we'll do the Sunday school hour. We'll break. They'll start the service, sing a couple of hymns or praise songs, whatever it is they do for for song worship. Mm -hmm. They'll have prayer, take their offering, give me the message time. And then we finish after lunch. Okay. And so it's four hours plus the breaks that you take. That's the key. So how would people contact you if they wanted to Well, my Well, my website is donsunshine.org, D-O-N-S-U-N-S-H-I-N-E.org. Okay. Training is called Make a Difference. Okay. My calendar's on the website. Uh, there's plenty of video testimonies. There's uh, pretty much anything you'd want to know about it is there. Now, you mentioned Ron Hutchcraft, and you have collaborated on some areas. Tell us a little bit about Ron Hutchcraft and his his input into your ministry. Well, Ron originally was with Youth for Christ, and he was, again, he had a passion for youth. Mm-hmm. And that's where I first met him. Uh, he He's done work for Billy Graham. He's a, I believe he's a Moody grad. And he started his own ministry out of Arkansas uh, at, you know, Ron Hutchcraft Ministries. And Mm -hmm. they really focus now on reaching Native American teens, which is the the largest at-risk group in the country. Wow. Huge percentage of of kids with, you know, teen suicide and drug problems and alcohol problems and violence. And and that's what they really focus on. 
initially uh, there was a, um, a kind of a loose relationship. They were going to feed me some leads, and if they got someone that needed training, they were going to give it to me. But it really didn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. He was so busy with all the other things that he was doing that it didn't come up very often. I think they gave me one one lead in Canada that I went and taught. Mm -hmm. But uh, and I think it was because they didn't want to go over to Canada. It was too cold. It was right. in the middle of winter. Right. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah. So really, we haven't done much together. Uh, he continues to do what he does, and uh, periodically, we I'm, some of his people are on my email list, mm -hmm. so they get my monthly reports, so they know how God is using this, and he, I, I've heard some responses through other people that he's just thrilled. Mm -hmm. Now, I heard you say last week when I heard you talking, uh, you mentioned this, this evening about you've done the training with middle school kids, and they've it's ignited their passion for evangelism, but you've also done training with seminary professors, am I right? <laughs> yeah, I was I was invited by the, the founder and president of Crown College of the Bible in Powell, Tennessee, to come and teach the faculty and staff of the Bible College and Seminary how to do what I do. Wow. And there were over 100 people in the room. They ran it from like 8 to 12 on a Friday before the semester started, a year ago, August 9th. Mm -hmm. And uh, the president got up when I was done. I sat down and turned it over to him. And this is exactly what he said. I was stunned. He said, "He said, folks, he says, you have just experienced the most impactful thing that's ever happened here. Wow. It's and I was amazing. like, I took a, kind of shook my head and was like, really? That's why I'm calling you doctor. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and then, I mean, the man who put the chronological Bible together was in the audience. <laughs> These are people with doctorates in theology. And, and I'm thinking, really? I'm going to teach them something? Well, it impacted the whole, the whole faculty and staff. In fact, the founder's wife came up to me afterwards, and she was sobbing. Mm. And she said, Don, this was life-changing for wow. us. Wow. And she said, had we had this training 10 years ago, Knoxville could have been a different city today. Mm. What is it that's different about your training versus what they were hearing? I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I'm a simple guy. I mean, I have no seminary degree. I have no Bible college degree. Mm. And I've had pastors say to me, Don, whatever you do, don't get ordained because mm. you're doing a good thing. The fact that you don't have a seminary degree or Bible college degree is proof to the people you're talking to that you don't have to have that to make disciples. Mm -hmm. You know, all you have to do is recognize the opportunities and take advantage of them. Amen. And so um, it's simple. It's easy to do. And, you know, I've done lots of event evangelism over the years. That's what I did with the kids. You know, we created these crazy events, you know, uh, these trips and and Ironman tournaments and all kinds of things to bring guys out to share Christ with them. But this is, you know, just recognizing the simple connections you have every day, mm. dealing with the fear, mm -hmm. and then knowing what to do and say. Amen. And that's as simple as it gets. So, you know, you're talking about Daytona Beach, mm -hmm. and it's kind of a planned trip. You know, yeah. you're, you're going there with the anticipation that you're going to spend X number of days mm -hmm. really focused on ministry and sharing how about your everyday life you know you're you're living at home you're going to the store mm -hmm. you're going here and there give us some ideas of some of the connections that you can make with people even in those areas well i'll give you an example okay I, we do this full time i mean that's that's our full-time mm -hmm. jobs but we have where i live there's a number of school districts that are dying for school bus drivers they mm -hmm. they they're short drivers every single day everybody in management has to drive they have mechanics driving and I've had a bus license since before I was a policeman. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, you know, they've been, they called me up and they said, could you please help us? I said, look, I can help you in the morning because I'll be back by nine. I can do my normal job, but I can't do the afternoon. It just, it'll break up my whole day. That became a huge mission field for me. Wow. Because I, as I went in there and she'd say, you know, the, the uh, assistant transportation coordinator would say, Don, ride with this person today because you're going to have to do their route next week. Mm hmm so in the course of conversation, they'd say, well, are you, um, uh, you know, uh, are you going to be doing the morning and afternoon? I said, no, I'm only doing the morning. They said, oh, how come? Well, because I have a, another job. They said, what do you do? I said, I have a ministry. They said, are you a minister? No, <laughs> but you have a ministry. Uh, you know, so what do you do in your ministry? I said, I teach people how to share their faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, do you go to church anywhere? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and I, end, I've, I, I, I have about 11 people on my daily prayer list that I've shared Christ with. Wow. And um, I'm praying for those people every day. I gave them some gospel literature to read. I followed up with a lot of them. Mm -hmm. I've given some of them multiple things to read. 
And here's a heartbreaker. I had one lady, I walked into the transportation office this one morning, heard this lady say, the Bible's nothing but a bunch of fairy tales and it's all, it's all <clears throat> fake and it's not real. And who could, in their right mind, could believe that anybody could cross the Red Sea on dry ground with walls of water on the side? And I went over and I said to her, I said, I, you know, I don't even know your name. I said, my name is Don, what's your name? And she said, my name is Jennifer. Now there's a whole bunch of people listening to this conversation, mm -hmm. okay? And I said, Jennifer, let me ask you a question. What are the chances that you could walk into a library, pick out 66 different books written by 40 different authors who most of them didn't know each other. These books are written over a period of 1500 years Wow! on three different continents mm -hmm. in three different languages. And when you put them all together and assemble them as one book, there would be a central theme that ran through that entire book with no contradictions or, or mistakes. She said, that's impossible. I said, that's what the Bible is. It's a supernatural book. It's the Word of God. Wow. And I said, and I said, in terms of Red Sea crossing, there's plenty of evidence. They've got chariot wheels on the bottom with axles standing up. They know exactly where what they happened. crossed. Yeah. Right. right at Pihai Haroth. And I ended up sharing a little book by Mark Cahill called One Second After You Die. It's mm -hmm. one of the tools that I like to give out. That one in particular is really good when you encounter someone who has doubts about the Bible or has doubts about Jesus being raised from the dead or that he was the son of God, because it does an entire apologetics presentation prior to giving an accurate gospel presentation. Mm -hmm. I gave her that book to read, and I said, I'd like you to read this and let me know what your thoughts are. Mm -hmm. This past Monday, in between runs in the morning, her husband died of a heart attack. Wow. And the funeral was this past Saturday. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened with that book. Mm -hmm. I don't know if she read it, if there was ever a decision, if she shared it with her husband. Right. But it became very real very quick. That's right. Now is the day of salvation. That's right. Today is None the of day us of are guaranteed one That's more right. heartbeat, one more breath. Right. And when God calls us home, there's no negotiating. Right. We're going. Yeah, and I could tell you, because we travel on weekends and we eat out, I could do four hours of waitress stories. Mm -hmm. Amazing things happen when you pray for waitresses. Right. Um, and some of them will run off in tears. Some of them will come back with multiple requests. Some of yes. them will grab your hand yes. when you pray. Yes. Uh, I just We just had one the other week. My wife and I were traveling. We came back, and uh, we were visiting down south. We were looking for home. And uh, we prayed for a waitress, and she just sobbed at the mm -hmm. table. That's right. And her heart was wide open for yeah. what we were going to share with her. That's right. It makes your day so much more interesting. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because you know you're on mission. Every day is a great adventure, right. and that's what most most professing Christians miss. Right. It's such joy. Oh, it's 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 not a chore. And yeah. it's not a job. That's some of the things Pastor Ron said. He goes, you know, he goes, people don't understand the blessing that they're missing by by not doing this. Right. Because yeah. you see the adventure, you oh, see the yeah. excitement. Yeah. And even if you don't see that profession of faith, you may be one person in a process in that individual's life yes. that, you know, I remember when Don shared with me. Yeah. Then I can remember when someone else shared with me and some someone prayed with me. And it might be some time down the road that person comes to well, faith. Yeah, one of the things I, I used to do in my training, I surveyed the first 10,000 people roughly that I trained. Mm -hmm. And I said, by a show of hands, how many of you were saved the very first time you heard the gospel? Seven hands went up. Mm -hmm. And I personally think the seven people forgot some of the little things Absolutely. that happen along the way. That's right. Okay, so it's a process. Point A is where they hear. Point B is where they make a decision. There's some number of links in the chain between those two. Right. And statistically, you're probably going to be in the middle, not at the very beginning and not at the very end. Right. God will allow you to be in both of those places, but I'll give you an example. Daytona, I have literally shared Christ with hundreds of people over 16 years. Mm -hmm. I didn't see one person come to faith in Christ while I was there. But when I got on my motorcycle, headed north to Columbia, South Carolina to get my truck and trailer, my heart is full because I mm -hmm. feel like I was faithful with the opportunities God gave me. That's right. You know? and, and I've noticed, uh, just to, to, as a little bit of an aside, sometimes when you're faithful in sharing your faith, God, I think, deliberately keeps us humble because he'll bring somebody in some other way. So he gets the glory. Oh, well, yeah. And, yeah we got to give him the glory. I think it's just his way of saying... You know, Remember who's in charge. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. I've heard you say, too, that in your training, that you do, it's Don Sunshine Ministry. Yeah. Dot .org. No, just donsunshine.org. Donsunshine.org. Right. So people want to go to your website. They can check out your schedule. They can. I think you even have videos on there of some of your training yeah, to there's, give people an example. There's a two-minute intro video that talks okay. about what we're going to cover, which is, 
How do I recognize the opportunities that God gives me every day to share my faith, but I miss them? Okay. What does it really mean to be an ambassador for Christ? Then we list the fears. I show people how to beat the fears. And then what do I do and say when the door opens? The first hour of the training is on the website in video format. Okay. So people can get a feel for how I, how I teach. You know, can I put sentences together that I'm not a heretic? You know, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just to give people a feel for it because there's three hours they're not getting. Right. And it's, it's meant to be kind of a teaser so that they want more after they hear that. Right. So anybody that's listening tonight and is interested, go to the website. Check Don it out. DonSunshine.org. DonSunshine.org. Training's called Make a Difference. Make a Difference Training. Check it out. Contact Don. He'd be happy to come to your, to your oh, yeah. facility and do some training for you. Be blessed. Now, I heard you say that in the training, some people have themselves have come to faith in Christ. That happens pretty regularly. Okay, having done 451 trainings, we get what I'll call the cream of the crop of the church to come out. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're the people that know they're, they, they, they believe they're saved. I know I'm supposed to be sharing my faith. I'm not doing it. Here's an opportunity for me to learn how easy it is to do it and to do it. Mm -hmm. Out of that group of people that have come out for the training, according to the evaluation forms, we've seen over 1,300 people get saved at the training. Wow, just through the training. Through the training. Wow, so they think they're believers. Yep. They go through the training, they discover they're not believers, right. and they receive Christ right. into their lives. And the reason is, I think, because we've watered down the gospel over the years. Mm -hmm. You know, it's become repeat after me, and all you got to do is say these words and you're going to heaven, and that's nowhere in the Bible. Right. No, in, nowhere in the Bible was anyone ever saved by praying a prayer. Nowhere in the Bible was anyone, did anyone ever say, you need to pray a prayer. Mm -hmm. Again, God looks at the heart. Now, you can express it in the form of a prayer, right. but it's a heart's decision. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is the Holy Spirit does what the Holy Spirit does. They sit through the, the last portion, which is, okay, what is the gospel mm -hmm. and how do I share it? And there's conviction. And we've seen four pastors get saved. Wow. We've seen a worship leader in a big Baptist church in South Carolina get saved. Two out of three members of a leadership team at a church got saved. Wow. An English teacher at a Christian school. I mean, it never ceases to amaze me. So people really have believed a false gospel. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and the gospel is, like you said, just say this prayer uh, and you're good. You can just have a ticket in your back pocket to heaven. Yeah, you got fire insurance. For but the real gospel is? Surrender to the Lordship of Christ in repentance and faith. And it's just a, a heart decision. It's a heart's decision. It's not a religion. It's not... Uh, some kind of magic formula. It's that relationship that God's offering to us through Jesus Christ. Amen. That's exactly and right. And it's that heart decision. And realizing, I've heard somebody say that, you know, all inadequate doctrines of salvation are because we don't understand who God really is. Mm -hmm. And we don't really understand who we really are. Mm -hmm. God is a holy God who desire, you know, who lives in perfection and nothing unholy can come into his presence. Well, it's interesting because uh, John MacArthur's book, Hard to Believe, I quote, uh, quote him in the training at one point, mm -hmm. but in his book, Hard to Believe, he talks about how hard it is to believe that this is the way God chose to redeem mankind mm -hmm. by sending his son and, you know, being born in a, a manure-filled stable and, That's right. you know, dying on a cross and, and all that. And, uh, he talks about the, you know, the fact that back then they they drank out of gold and silver mm -hmm. cups, and when he, when it talks about us being clay pots, those were the privy pots, mm. and it shows the dramatic contrast that you know we are the privy pots mm -hmm. compared to a perfect and holy God. That's right. You that's know, right. and and that's kind of amazing when you think about it. That's right. We have a few moments left, and. I'd like to ask you, what are some of your favorite scriptures? And maybe some of the scriptures you would use when you would share with someone even about salvation. Well, obviously, John 3.16 John 3, is one. Right. And, you know, the word repent is another good one. I mean, the scripture says, all must repent. Mm -hmm. well, Jesus himself said in Luke 13.3 and Luke 13.5, unless you repent, you too mm -hmm. all perish. That's right. So why is it that that's left out of most gospel tracts and out of most gospel presentations? Mm -hmm. And so I thought about it. I said, okay, salvation hinges on a repentant heart because Jesus made it mandatory. Mm -hmm. So what does that really mean? Well, the word in the Greek is metanoia, which mm -hmm. means a change of mind, heart, life, and purpose. Mm -hmm. So there's a, head, a decision you make in your head. I'm not going to sin anymore. I'm going to be obedient to Christ. Mm -hmm. It needs to drop 14 inches into your heart where it says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that's where conversion takes place. Right. It's got to have a proper heart. 
your life will change. You're not going to live like the world anymore. You're mm-hmm. going to live as a follower of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. And number four, your purpose for being here will change. Well, that one concerned me a little bit. Mm-hmm. Okay, what does that mean? My purpose is going to change. I think sometimes what we forget, because we live in the time period we live in, we're very far removed from the master-slave relationship. Mm-hmm. But the Bible says we were slaves to sin. That's right. We were purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, and now we are slaves to Christ. Amen. He owns us. Mm-hmm. Well, if you're a slave and you have a master and your master tells you to do something, you better be obedient and do it. That's right. And, and we need to do that wholeheartedly. Our mm-hmm. purpose for being here is to follow Jesus Christ and to make disciples. Amen. He commanded us in Matthew 28 to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them mm-hmm. in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mm. And he promised to be with us when we do that. Amen. And those are great promises. Also, um, the the part of the one from, uh, let me think, no, I just lost it. I have one of those brain moments um, where he talks about the Holy Spirit living in you, that he's, okay. he's, um, he, will, he will give you the power mm-hmm. to do what pleases him, the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Right. For God has not given us a, a spirit of fear and timidity, but a power, love, and self-discipline. Mm-hmm. So never be ashamed to tell others about the Lord. That's right. And we forget sometimes that that Holy Spirit lives inside of us. Tremendous power. It is tremendous. But he won't force himself on us. Mm-hmm. If we surrender to him, we're sensitive to his leading, mm-hmm. and we're obedient, he'll give us what we need to do. Mm-hmm to be able to do it. And I've got some amazing stories about that that I usually share at the training, but we don't have the time right now. Yeah. You know. We have a few minutes left. Um, you had mentioned about repentance. Mm-hmm. And repentance is that change of heart, mind, life and purpose. Life and purpose. And that is so often missing in the gospel today. Oh, so yeah. Where we talk about sin and people just maybe, like you said, say the prayer and they forget about repentance that we need to turn away from those things that displease God and turn towards God right. with the things that please him. It's a change in direction. Right. And it's an about face if you're a right. military person. Yeah. And and the problem is it's not even mentioned in most gospel presentations. Mm-hmm. And I have a video that illustrates that perfectly. It's the way the master team interviewing a pastor's daughter and her two girlfriends who are going out to get drunk. Mm. And they question her and and her answer, well, how she responds to the question, just it, people are, I've had so many people come to me and say, that's my story. Mm-hmm. And she says, you know, wait a minute, wait a minute. She goes, my dad is a preacher. I was raised in a Christian home. I know God, I have a relationship with God. I mean, everybody sins. I don't think they're going out and drinking every once in a while is a sin. Mm-hmm. He said, well, you said getting drunk was a sin and the three of you are going out to get to go get drunk. Mm-hmm. And she laughs and she goes, yeah, I think you're right. And then she says this, this is exactly what she said. She said, for some reason, I'm just so caught up in the world. Mm. I, it, I, it's like when I turn to God, but when everyone else is not around, meaning the true believers, I let other things get back in, and I've done that my entire life. My mm. entire life, I've always done that. Mm. You know, I believe there's three kinds of believers. Mm-hmm. True believers surrender their lives to the Lordship of Christ, repentance and faith. They're born again. They live for Jesus when no one's looking. Mm-hmm. Unbelievers. We don't want to believe in God. Right. The third group is the group that fills churches in America. Mm. And they're going to hear the seven scariest words in all the Bible from Matthew chapter 7. Say, Lord, I cast out demons in your name. I perform miraculous signs in your name. He's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Wow. That group I call the make-believers. Yes. And our churches in America are full of make-believers. Right. They go through the motions. They show up in church. They, they'll volunteer for some jobs. They'll throw some money in the plate. But when Jesus said, many will come to me on that day, he's stuck. It, it's, the world isn't doing those things. Mm-hmm. It's church people that are doing those things. That's right. And he said, many will come to me on that day, and I'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. Wow. So if you are listening tonight, and you're a make-believer, it's time to make that transition from make-believer to true believer. Amen. And you do that by repentance, trusting what Jesus did for you, and invite donsunshine.org. <laughs> right. Check him out. Check out his ministry. And if you're a pastor, you're a church leader, you're a member of a church, or you're just somebody that's listening tonight, you would really benefit from this training. I think it would be, uh, I'm going to bring you over to our church and have you do a training at our church some, awesome. sometime. I know you're in a little bit of a transition period uh, with moving and stuff, but I just am impressed with you, Don. I think um, what I see in you is a real joy. You've never let the gospel grows stale in your life. You've never gone far from the cross. 
you've realized what Jesus has done for you, and you're living just a life of joy and gratitude. Amen. And it is a blessing to be able to have you here tonight. Thank you. And to hear a little bit about your ministry. And may the Lord bless you in your future endeavors. And hopefully sometime we'll be able to have you come back and share some more with us. And I uh, just enjoyed it so much tonight. So thank you very much for being here. And one closing word. Thank you and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to all of you. And good night and we'll see you soon.